Thomas Jefferson is my eighth cousin, five times removed. Thomas Jefferson was born on April 13, 1743, at the family's Shadwell Plantation in the British Colony of Virginia, the third of ten children. He was of English and possibly Welsh descent and was born a British subject. His father, Peter Jefferson, was a planter and surveyor who died when Jefferson was 14. His mother was Jane Randolph. Peter Jefferson moved his family to Tuckahoe Plantation in 1745 upon the death of William Randolph III, the plantation's owner and Jefferson's friend, who in his will had named Peter guardian of Randolph's children. The Jeffersons returned to Shadwell in 1752. In 1753, Thomas attended the wedding of his uncle, Field Jefferson, to Mary Ellen Hunt, and Field became a close friend and early mentor. Jefferson's father, Peter, died in 1757, and his estate was divided between his sons, Thomas and Randolph. John Harvey Sr. then became 13-year-old Thomas's guardian. Thomas inherited approximately 5,000 acres of land, which included Monticello, and he assumed full legal authority over the property at age 21. Jefferson began his education together with the Randolph children at Tuckahoe under the guidance of tutors. Thomas's father, Peter, who was self-taught and regretted not having a formal education, entered Thomas into an English school at age five in 1752. At age nine, he attended a local school run by Scottish Presbyterian minister by a Scottish Presbyterian minister and also began studying the natural world which he grew to love. At this time he began studying Latin, Greek, and French while learning to ride horses as well. Thomas also read books from his father's modest library. He was taught from 1758 to 1760 by the Reverend James Murray near Gordonville, Virginia, where he studied history, science, and the classics while boarding with Murray's family. Jefferson then befriended and came to know various American Indians, including the well-known Cherokee chief Ostinaco, who often stopped at Shadwell to visit on their way to Williamsburg to trade. During the two years Jefferson was with the Murray family, he traveled to Williamsburg and was a guest to Colonel John Dandridge, father to Martha Washington. In Williamsburg, the young Jefferson met and came to admire Patrick Henry, eight years his senior, and shared a common interest in violin playing. Jefferson entered the College of William and Mary in Williamsburg, Virginia in 1761 at age 16 and studied mathematics, metaphysics, and philosophy with William Small. Under Small's tutelage, Jefferson encountered the ideas of the British uh, em, em, empire, 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 mm, empiricist, empiricists, including John Locke, 
Francis Bacon, and Isaac Newton. Small introduced Jefferson to George With and Francis Fokir. Small With and Fokir recognized Jefferson as a man of exceptional ability and included him in their inner circle where he became a regular member of their Friday dinner parties where politics and philosophy were discussed. Jefferson later wrote that while there he heard more common good sense, more rational and philosophical conversations than in all the rest of my life. During his first year at college, Jefferson spent a considerable amount of time attending parties and dancing and, uh, and was not very frugal with his expenditures. In his second year, regretting that he felt he had squandered away time and money, in his first year he committed to studying 15 hours a day. Jefferson improved his French and Greek and his skill at the violin. He graduated two years after starting in 1762. He read the law under with tutelage to obtain his law license while working as a law clerk in his office. He also read a wide variety of English classics and political works. Jefferson was well read in a broad variety of subjects, which, along with law and philosophy, included history, natural law, natural religion, ethics, a several areas in science, including agriculture. Overall, he drew very deeply on the philosophers. During the years of study under the watchful eye of With, Jefferson authored a survey of his extensive readings in his commonplace book. With was so impressed with Jefferson that he later bequeathed his entire library to him. In July 1765, Jefferson's sister Martha married his close friend and college companion Dabney Carr, which was greatly pleasing to Jefferson. In October of that year, however, Jefferson mourned his sister Jane's unexpected death at age 25. He wrote a farewell epitaph for her in Latin. Jefferson treasured his books and amassed three sizable libraries in his lifetime. He began assembling his first library, which grew to 200 volumes in his youth. It included books inherited from his father and left to him by George With, but was destroyed when his Shadwell home burned in a 1770 fire. His second library, however, replenished the first. It grew to 1,250 titles by 1773 and to nearly 6,500 volumes by 1814. Jefferson or organized his wide variety of books into three broad categories corresponding with elements of the human mind memory, reason, and imagination. After the British destroyed the Library of Congress in August 1814 in the burning of Washington, Jefferson sold his second library to the U.S. government for $23,950, hoping to help jumpstart the Library of Congress's collection and rebuilding. Jefferson used a portion of the proceeds to pay off some of his large debt, remitting 
10,500 to William Short and 4,870 to John Barnes of Georgetown. However, Jefferson soon resumed collecting what amounted to his third personal library, writing to John Adams, I cannot live without books. He began to construct his third library with many of his personal favorites. By the time of his death, a decade later, the library had grown to nearly 2,000 volumes. Jefferson was admitted to the Virginia Bar in 1767 and lived with his mother at Shadwell. He represented Albemarle County as a delegate in the Virginia House of Burgesses from 1769 until 1775. He pursued reforms to slavery, including writing and sponsoring legislation in the 1769 to strip power away from the royal governor and courts, instead providing masters of slaves with the discretion to emancipate them. Jefferson persuaded his cousin Richard Bland to spearhead the legislation's passage, but it faced strong opposition in a state where economy was largely ag agrarian. 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 Hmm. Jefferson also took seven cases of freedom seeking slaves and waived his fee for one he claimed should be free before the minimum statutory age of emancipation. Jefferson invoked natural law, arguing everyone comes into the world with a right to his own person and using it at his own will. This is what is called personal liberty and is given him by the author of nature because it is necessary for his own sustenance. The judge cut him off and ruled against his client as a consolation. Jefferson gave his client some money which was conceivably used to aid his escape shortly thereafter. However, Jefferson's underlying intellectual argument that all people were entitled by their creator to what he labeled a natural right to liberty is one he would later incorporate <coughs> as he set about authoring the Declaration of Independence. He also took on 68 cases for the General Court of Virginia in 1767. In addition to three notable cases, Howe v. Netherland, 1770, Bowling v. Bowling in 1771, and Blair v. Blair in 1772. In 1768, Jefferson began, began constructing his primary residence, Monticello, whose name in Italian means Little Mountain, on a hilltop overlooking his 5,000 plant, 5, acre plantation. He spent most of his adult life designing Monticello as architect and was quoted as saying, architecture is my delight and putting up and pulling down one of my favorite amusements. Construction was done mostly by local masons and carpet carpenters, assisted by Jefferson's slaves. He moved into the South Pavilion in 1770, 
turning Monticello into a neoclassical masterpiece in the Palladian style was his perennial project. On January 1, 1772, Jefferson married his third cousin, Martha Wales, or Wales Skelton, the 23-year-old widow of Bathurst Skelton, and she moved into the South Pavi Pavilion. She was a frequent hostess of Jefferson and managed the large household. Biographer Dumas Malone described the marriage as the happiest period of Jefferson's life. Martha read widely, did fine needlework, and was a skilled pianist. Jefferson office accompanied her on the violin and cello. Jefferson was the primary author of the Declaration of Independence. At age 33, he was one of the youngest delegates to the Second Continental Congress beginning in 1775 at the outbreak of the American Revolutionary War, where a formal Declaration of Independence from Britain was overwhelmingly favored. Jefferson was inspired by the Enlightenment ideals of the sanctity of the individual and the writings of Locke and Montesquieu. Jefferson sought out John Adams, a Continental Congress delegate from Massachusetts and an emergence, emerging leader in the Congress. They became close friends and Adams supported Jefferson's appointment to the Committee of Five, which was charged by the Congress with authoring a Declaration of Independence. The five included Adams, Jefferson, Benjamin Franklin from Pennsylvania, Robert R. Livingston from New York, and Roger Sherman from Connecticut. The committee initially thought that Adams should write the document, but Adams persuaded the committee to choose Jefferson. Jefferson consulted with his fellow committee members over the next 17 days, but mostly wrote the Declaration of Independence in isolation between June 11 and 28, 1776, from the second floor of a three-story Georgian-style home he was renting at 700 Market Street in Center City, Philadelphia. The residence was then owned by Jacob Graff, a bricklayer whose grandparents had immigrated to Philadelphia from Germany in 1741. In authoring the Declaration, Jefferson drew considerably on his proposed draft of the Virginia Constitution, George Mason's draft of the Virginia Declaration of Rights, and other sources. Other committee members made some changes, and a final draft was presented to Congress on June 28, 1776. Congress began debate over its contents on July 1, resulting in the remo remo removal of roughly a fourth of Jefferson's original draft, including a passage authored that was critical of King George III and Jefferson's anti-slavery clause, which criticized King George III for importing slavery to the colonies. Jefferson resented the changes, but he did not speak publicly about the revisions. On July 4, 1776, the Congress ratified the Declaration and 
delegates signed it on August 2nd. In so doing, the delegates were knowingly committing an act of high treason against the crown, which was deemed the most serious criminal offense and was punishable by torture and death, including hanging almost to the point of death, followed by emasculation, disembowelment, decapitation, and dismemberment, with the remains then often displayed in public to serve as a warning of the fate of traitors. During their tenure of marriage, Martha bore six children. Martha in 1772, Jane in 1774, an unnamed son who lived for only a few weeks in 1777, Uh, Mary in 1784. Only Martha and Mary survived to adulthood. Martha's father, John Wayless, died in 1773, and the couple inherited 135 slaves and 11,000 acres and the estate's debts. The debts took Jefferson years to satisfy contributing to his financial problems. Martha later suffered from ill health, including diabetes and frequent childbirth further weakened her. Her mother had died young and Martha lived with two stepmothers as a girl. A few months after the birth of her last child, she died on September 6, 1782, with Jefferson at her bedside. Shortly before her death, Martha made Jefferson promise never to marry again, telling him that she could not bear to have other she could not bear to have another woman raise her children. Jefferson was grief stricken by her death. Relentlessly pacing back and forth, nearly to the point of exhaustion. He emerged after three weeks, taking long rambling rides on secluded roads with his daughter Martha. By her description, a solitary witness to many a violent burst of grief. Jefferson thought that the independent yeoman and agrarian life were ideals for Republican virtues. He distrusted cities and financiers, favored decentralized government power, and believed that the tyranny that had plagued the common man in Europe was due to corrupt political establishments and monarchies. He supported efforts to disassemblish, to dis, disestablish, disestablish the Church, disestablish the Church of England. He wrote the Virginia Statute of Religious Freedom and he pressed for a wall of separation between church and state. The Republicans under Jefferson were strongly influenced by the 18th century British Whig Party, which believed in limited government. His Democratic Republican Party became dominant in early American politics, and his views became known as Jeffersonian democracy. Jefferson was appointed a Virginia delegate to the Congress of the Confederation. Organized following victory in the Revolutionary War, 
and the peace treaty with Great Britain in 1783. He was a member of the committee setting foreign exchange rates and recommended an American currency based on the decimal system which was adopted. He advised the for formation of the Committee of the States to fill the power vacuum when Congress was in recess. The committee met when Congress adjourned, but disagreements rendered it dysfunctional. On May 7, 1784, Jefferson was appointed by the Congress of the Confederation to join Benjamin Franklin and John Adams in Paris as Minister Plenipotentiary for negotiating treaties of amity and commerce with Great Britain and other countries. With his young daughter Patsy and two servants, he departed in July 1784, arriving in Paris the next month. Jefferson and Patsy, Jefferson had Patsy educated at the Pentamont Abbey. Less than a year later, he was assigned the additional duty of succeeding Franklin as minister to France. French Foreign Minister Count de Virginis commented, You replace Monsieur Franklin, I hear. Jefferson replied, I succeed. No man can replace him. During his five years in Paris, Jefferson played a leading role in shaping U.S. foreign policy. Sarah Sally Hemings, 1773 to 1835, was an enslaved woman with one quarter African ancestry owned by Thomas Jefferson, one of many he inherited from his father-in-law, John Wayless. Hemings' mother was Elizabeth Hemings, the daughter of an enslaved African woman and English Captain John Hemings. Sally's father, the owner of Betty, John Wayless, was also the father of Jefferson's wife, Martha. Sally and half-sister to Jefferson's wife and was approximately three-quarters English descent. Martha died during her marriage in 1782. In 1787, when she was 14, Sally Hemings accompanied Jefferson's daughter, also named Martha, to Paris where they joined Thomas Jefferson. There, Sally was a legally free and paid servant, as slavery was not legal in France. At some time during her 26 months in Paris, the widower Jefferson began, began intimate relations with her. As attested by her son, Madison Hemings, Sally later agreed with Jefferson that she would return to Virginia and resume her life in slavery as long as all her children would be freed when they came of age. Multiple lines of evidence, including modern DNA analysis, indicate that Jefferson impregnated Hemming several times over years while they lived together on Jefferson's Monticello estate, and as historians now broadly agree that he was the father of her six children, whether this should be cons described as rape remains a matter of controversy. Four of Hemings' children survived into adulthood and were freed as they came of age during Thomas Jefferson's life, 
or in his will. Hemings died in Charlottesville, Virginia in 1835 in the home of her freed sons. Soon after returning from France, Jefferson accepted President Washington's invitation to serve as a Secretary of State. Pressing issues at the time were the national debt and the permanent location of the capital. He opposed a national debt, preferring that each state retire its own in contrast to Secretary of the Treasury Alexander Hamilton, who desired consol consolidation of various states' debts by the federal government. Hamilton also had bold plans to establish the National Credit and National Bank, National Credit and a National Bank, but Jefferson strenuously opposed this and attempted to undermine his agenda, which nearly led Washington to dismiss him from his cabinet. He later, let, he later left the cabinet voluntarily. In the presidential campaign of 1796, Jefferson lost the electoral college vote to Federalist John Adams by 71 to 68 and was thus elected vice president. As presiding officer of the Senate, he assumed a more passive role than his predecessor, John Adams. He allowed the Senate to freely conduct debates and confined his participation to procedural issues, which he called an honor, honorable and easy role. Jefferson had previously studied parliamentary law and procedure for 40 years, making him quite qualified to serve as presiding officer. In 1800, he published his assembled notes on Senate procedure as a manual for parliamentary practice. He cast only three tie-breaking votes in the Senate. In four confidential talks with French consul Joseph Latombe in the spring of 1797, Jefferson attacked Adams and predicted that his rival would serve only one term. He also encouraged France to invade England and, in, and advised Latombe to stall any American envoys sent to Paris by instructing him to listen to them and then drag out the negotiations at length and uh, mollify them by the urbanity, urbanity, urbanity of the proceedings. This toughened the tone that the French government adopted towards the Adams administration. After Adams' initial peace envoys were rebuffed, Jefferson and his supporters lobbied for the release of papers related to the incident called the XYZ Affair. After the letters used to disguise the identities of the French officials involved. However, the tactic backfired when it was revealed that French officials had demanded bribes, rallying public support against France. The U.S. began an undeclared naval war with France known as the Kazai War. Jefferson contended for president once more against John Adams in 1800. 
Adams campaign was weakened by unpopular tax and vicious Federalist infighting over his actions in the Kaze War. Democratic Republicans pointed to the Alien and Sedition Acts and accused the Federalists of being secret pro-Britain monarchists, while Federalists charged that Jefferson was a godless libertarian beholding to the French. Historian Joyce Appleby said the election was one of the most acrimonious in the annals of American history. The Democratic Republicans ultimately won more electoral college votes due in part to the electors that re resulted from the addition of three-fifths of the South's slaves to the population calculation under the 35th Compromise. Jefferson and his vice presidential candidate, Aaron Burr, unexpectedly received an equal total. Because of the tie, the election was decided by the Federalist-dominated House of Representatives. Hamilton lobbied Federalist representatives on Jefferson's behalf, believing him a lesser political evil than Burr. On February 17, 1801, after 36 ballots, the House elected Jefferson president and Burr vice president. Jefferson became the second incumbent vice president to be elected president. Jefferson was sworn, as a pre sworn in as president by Chief Justice John Marshall at the new Capitol in Washington, D.C. on March 4, 1801. His inauguration was not attended by outgoing President Adams. In contrast to his two predecessors, Jefferson exhibited a dislike of formal etiquette. Plainly dressed, he chose to walk alongside friends to the Capitol from his nearby boarding house that day instead of arriving by carriage. His inaugural address struck a note of reconciliation and commitment to democratic ideology, declaring, We have been called by different names, brethren of the same principle. We are all Republicans. We are all Federalists. Ideologically, he stressed equal and exact justice to all men, minority rights, and freedom of speech, religion, and press. He said that a free and democratic government was the strongest government on earth. He nominated moderate Republicans to his cabinet, James Madison as Secretary of State, Henry Dearborn as Secretary of War, Levi Lincoln as Attorney General, and Robert Smith as Secretary of the Navy. Widowed since 1782, Jefferson first relied on his two daughters to serve as his official hostesses. In late May 1801, he asked Dolly Madison, wife of his longtime friend James Madison, to be the permanent White House hostess. She accepted, realizing the diplomatic importance of the position. She was also in charge of the completion of the White House mansion. Dolly served as White House hostess for the rest of Jefferson's two terms and then for eight more years as First Lady while her husband served as President.
One of the most significant achievements of Jefferson's first administration was the purchase of the Louisiana Territory from France for $15 million in 1803 at more than 820,000 square miles. The Louisiana Purchase, which included lands extending between the Mississippi River and the Rocky Mountains and the Gulf of Mexico, to present-day Canada, effectively doubled the size of the United States. Jefferson then commissioned explorer Meriwether Lewis and William Clark to explore the uncharted land, plus the area beyond, out to the Pacific Ocean. At the time, most Americans lived within 50 miles of the Atlantic Ocean. Lewis and Clark's expedition lasted from 1804 to 1806 and provided valuable information about the geography, American Indian tribes, and animal and plant life of the western part of the continent. In 1804, Jefferson ran for re-election and defeated Federalist candidate Charles Pickney, 1746-1825, of South Carolina with more than 70% of the popular vote and an electrical, electrical, electoral, electoral count of 162-14. During his second term, Jefferson focused on trying to keep America out of Europe's Napoleonic Wars, 1803-1815. However, after Great Britain and France, who were at war, both began harassing American merchant ships, Jefferson implemented the Embargo Act of 1807. The act, which closed U.S. ports to foreign trade, proved unpopular with Americans and hurt the U.S. economy. It was repealed in 1809, and despite the president's attempts to maintain neutral, the U.S. ended up going to war against Britain in the War of 1812, Jefferson chose not to run for a third term in 1808 and was succeeded in office by James Madison, a fellow Virginian and former U.S. Secretary of State. After the end of his term in office, Jefferson remained influential and continued to correspond with many of the country's leaders, including his two protégés who succeeded him as president. The Monroe Doctrine bears a strong resemblance to solicited advice that Jefferson gave to Monroe in 1823. Jefferson was a farmer, obsessed with new crops, soil conditions, garden designs, scientific agricultural techniques. His main cash crop was tobacco, but its price was uh, usually low and it was rarely profitable. He tried to achieve self-sufficiency with wheat, vegetables, flax, corn, hogs, sheep, poultry, and cattle to supply his family slaves and employees, but he lived perpetually beyond his means and was always in debt. Jefferson's approximately 100,000 of debt weighed heavily on his mind in his final months. As it became increasingly clear that he would have little to leave to his heirs. In February 1826, he successfully applied to the General Assembly to hold a public lottery 
as a fundraiser. His health began to deteriorate in July 1825 due to a combination of rheumatism from his arm and wrist injuries as well as as well as intestinal and urinary urinary disorders by june 1826 he was confined to bed on july 3 overcome by fever jefferson declined an invitation to attend an anniversary celebration of the declaration in the national capital of washington during the last hours of his life, he was accompanied by his family members and friends. Jefferson died on July 4, 1826, at 12.50 p.m. at age 83, on the 50th anniversary of the adoption of the Declaration of Independence, which he authorized. In the moments prior to his death, Jefferson instructed his treating physician no doctor nothing more refusing laudanum but his final significant words were is it the fourth or this is the fourth when John Adams died later that same day his last words included an acknowledgment of his longtime friend and rival. Thomas Jefferson survives, though Adams was unaware that Jefferson had died several hours before. The sitting president was Adams' son, John Quincy Adams, and he called the coincidence of their death on the nation's anniversary visible and palpable remarks of divine favor. Shortly after Jefferson died, attendants found a gold locket on a chain around his neck where it had rested for more than 40 years, containing a small faded blue ribbon that tied a lock of his wife Martha's brown hair. Jefferson was interred at Monticello under an epitaph that he wrote. Here was buried Thomas Jefferson, author of the Declaration of American Independence, of the Statue of Virginia for Religious Freedom, and father of the University of Virginia. Jefferson died deeply in debt and was unable to pass on his estate freely to his heirs. He gave instructions in his will for disposal of his assets, including the freeing of Sally Hemings' children, but his estate, possessions, and slaves were sold at public auction starting in 1827. In 1831, Monticello was sold by Martha Jefferson Randolph and the other heirs.